Hi, my name is Keith Schilling. I'm the state geologist of Iowa and the director of the Iowa Geological Survey at the University of Iowa. Uh, we're standing today um, at one of my favorite places in Iowa, which is the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge outside of Prairie City, Iowa. Uh, this is a location that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been working to convert uh, former row crop uh, land of corn and soybeans in back into native prairie and this is a really good place to start um, a discussion about why streams are the way they are and we really can't talk about the the formation and the behavior and characteristics of streams without thinking about the watershed that drains into them uh, this is a great location to stop and take a look at what the landscape used to look like pre-settlement versus what it looks like today in many areas of Iowa. If you uh, pan over to the uh, left here, this is a, a prairie restoration that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been working on uh, for 15 or 20 years. And you can kind of see that it's dominated by uh, tall grasses. And if it was, we're out here at a different time, you'd see beautiful flowers and forbs. And this is a landscape that uh, Iowa used to consist of, okay? This is tall grass prairie uh, had been around for thousands of years. And this is a landscape where precipitation falls on this landscape. Most of the precipitation infiltrates and is taken up by the plants and evapo, evapo transpired back into the, in the atmosphere. So a landscape with native prairie is an infiltration based landscape. Uh, we get, you can kind of see the roughness of this land. We're not gonna get a lot of runoff uh, most everything soaks in like a sponge. On my right here is what the landscape was converted to. Uh, in the late 1800s through uh, today, much of this land that was in prairie has been converted to row crop farmland for corn and soybean production. Um, and what this landscape is, you can kind of tell at this time we're in the fall, it's all been harvested. And what we see is a landscape that largely consists of bare ground with some residue on there. Uh, this is a ground that is not actively, um, uh, we don't have plants and vegetation actively taking up that water. This is what it's gonna look like until about June next year when the crops start, start to emerge. Rainfall, for the same amount of rainfall falling over here on this row crop land, a lot of it will run off. And when it runs off, it gets quickly rotted to the stream. We have a lot of stream flow and discharge and flashiness behavior of the streams. So what we see is a landscape that was converted from an infiltration-based landscape to a runoff-based landscape. And in here, uh, with most of that water running off or soaking up into the ground here with no uh, transpiration by the uh, vegetation, we see the hydrology completely different with these two landscapes. So um, this is a great location to talk about what happens when we convert a landscape from native prairie uh, to row crop. You know, we've completely changed the water balance. You know, the ET is greater in prairie than it is in um, um, row crop lands. And consequently, we have less discharge and less runoff over here in prairie than we do with the row crop land cover. So because of that, we see our streams uh, showing the behavior of that and having more water discharge in the stream and more water per unit area as this conversion has occurred. So when this uh, discharge reaches the stream and we get a lot of runoff, and one thing to keep in mind is that today, um, through the efforts of the um, NRCS and the USDA, we are a lot better as a uh, community of agricultural producers about keeping water on the landscape. You can see that we have residue here um, that is, is uh, preventing some of that uh, runoff from occurring. Uh, but historically, before some of these conservation programs developed, this was largely just fall tilled and bare ground. Raindrops hitting that are not really um, being taken up um, by the vegetation and there's not a whole lot to prevent that runoff from occurring. When that water gets into the stream, um, it reaches there quickly, okay? Um, imagine an entire basin with slopes uh, 
having water from this field getting into that stream, it's going to reach there quickly um, and consequently the stream flow is going to rise really rapidly in that stream uh, and because of that rapid rise of stream flow with a lot of discharge coming in, we see a lot of, of consequences because of that. We see a lot of uh, stream bank erosion, we see a lot of down cutting, and we see streams incising into their floodplain. So we're at a different location in the Walnut Creek watershed, the same watershed that contains the Neil Smith Refuge. Uh, we're up in the headwater area. This is the headwaters are essentially where streams originate. And in this location um, and throughout much of Iowa, streams originate uh, from subsurface drainage, tile drainage. And this is the location where uh, stream flows just starts. It starts at the end of a pipe, flows underneath the road, and now we have a channel that m migrates uh, through the watershed. Tile drainage uh, is done in Iowa uh, in a couple different ways, but it's done mainly to improve uh, the crop performance. Okay? Uh, corn and soybeans don't like to have their roots in water. Uh, we get some rainfall that can be poorly timed for when the crops need it. Uh, and so farmers and producers will uh, put tile, subsurface perforated pipe, in the ground at about four feet down to drain uh, this excess water and soil moisture. Uh, many farmers and producers will install a network of subsurface drainage pipes throughout Iowa to drain the excess water and soil moisture to allow the crops to, to grow more effectively. Uh, these are typically uh, four inch, six inch, uh, they used to be clay, now they're black plastic perforated pipes that, that are put uh, in low areas or in patterns across uh, poorly drained fields uh, to drain this excess water. Um, in southern Iowa, in this landscape, the, the landscape tends to be more rolling, so a lot of the tiles are put in following the waterways or following the low areas in the landscape to drain that water off. Uh, there's a, a location right here beside us where uh, the tiles are actually flowing, even though it's November and it hasn't rained in quite a while, there's still some water seeping out of the, of the tile. Uh, these low areas are, are drained um, um, mainly so these, these tractors can cross those and uh, not get, get, get stuck. Uh, and also to prevent gullies from migrating up the watershed in these uh, low areas. Uh, where this tile is discharging right here, you're going to see uh, that there's a grade stabilization structure put in there to support um, the tile network and also to prevent the gullies from migrating up the, the sides of the hill. You can see that there has been on both of these waterways gully formation uh, because of the excess water from this runoff based landscape. So here, as, a, as opposed to our a location is contrasting with the prairie, here's what we get a chance to see this rolling countryside and row crop land cover on this rolling countryside. You see from the slopes behind me that raindrops falling on this landscape, freshly tilled with this uh, uh, ammonia fertilizer application uh, can really generate some, some runoff and some pollutant loads in our streams. These tiles that we talked about are the main source of, subs of nitrate nitrogen to our streams. Um, in, any, in other locations in north central Iowa, these tiles are also the main source of the water in the streams. We did some work in the Boone River watershed uh, and showed that these tiles can account for as much as 60% of the water flow in the, in the Boone River can come from subsurface drainage tiles. It's really hard to underestimate the impact on the hydrology and the water quality from this subsurface tile network. These tiles, because they contribute flow to the streams, um, also contribute to the, the status of our streams in terms of the excess water delivered from these tiles uh, in addition to the runoff is causing some of the erosion problems that we see in our streams. So these tiles, um, while they improve the agricultural productivity, have a hu huge effect on uh, both the water quality and the water quantity in our streams. So we've, we've moved locations and now we're seeing the consequences of how we've changed this watershed from 
uh, prairie to row crop with tile drainage and excess runoff. Uh, we're in the, within the channel now of Walnut Creek, which is the, the third order channel uh, migrate or the stream migrating through the Neil Smith refuge. Early settler accounts um, map this area and at that time they described Walnut Creek as being about six feet wide and something you could jump over. In fact you could take your wagon across it and nobody would think anything of it. Today you can see the channel is probably 50-60 feet wide from bank to bank and now it's been cut down or incised into its floodplain uh, on the order of 10 to 12 feet. Um, so this is the consequence of throwing uh, or, or having a lot of extra water, um, high energy water delivered to the channel. Um, now when it rains, instead of this uh, normal system where the water would go up in the stream channel and then the water would dissipate into a floodplain, usually that would occur once every one and a half to two years. Now, any flood flow is contained within the channel itself. It, it, it's only the most uh, remarkable flows that have occurred maybe two or three times in the 20 years I've been out here studying that that flow has ever reached the top of this bank and dissipated into the floodplain. So now, all the energy of the water is contained within the channel uh, and we and we continually try and this water continually is eroding um, the bed and the banks within the channel. You see evidence of this behind me. For example, this tree uh, that used to be um, on the floodplain. Uh, now it's been eroded down. We see the roots exposed. This is the evidence, uh, among other things, showing the extent of uh, bank erosion going on here. Uh, what has slowed this, as opposed to the Luss Hills in western Iowa, which are uh, more deeply incised than this, is that there's a bottom here to this stream. Um, we have different layers of geology that make up the depositional environment of this floodplain. There's a bottom here that seems to be more resistive to erosion, preventing the stream from cutting down any further. So as these streams evolve over time, there's usually a quick incision where it cuts down to something that's going to prevent the bank, uh, the bed erosion from occurring, and then it's starting to widen. And what we're into this phase right now for this evolution of this stream channel is we're in the widening phase, and slowly we're going to widen this thing out far enough where the stream is going to start meandering within the, the new newly formed channel. We say, see evidence of that uh, in different locations that this stream wants to meander wants to migrate back and forth and so we see some evidence up here more evidence downstream where even within the confines of this channel uh, we see the stream wanting to meander back and forth so over time uh, this will recover the time frame though um, it's something you know probably beyond what we can comprehend we've been doing restoration studies out here uh, for 20 plus years and we can see from our first stop that we can restore the hydrology a little bit in an upland uh, but as we go to this stream channel this is the uh, result of all the accumulated activities in the watershed scale causing this stream to be the situation that it is this will not recover uh, in any anybody's lifetime okay this is going to take a long time uh, to recover back to some normalcy um, as, uh, as the watershed around it improves. So this is the last, last thing available that's going to recover uh, within this, this restoration project for the watershed. So here we see evidence of what Walnut Creek or what all streams want to do, which is they want to, they want to meander. They're like machines, okay? These streams are migrating down, down slope. They pick up sediment and they erode sediment. Okay, so what we see here is even within the confines of this incised channel, the stream is starting to meander. You see it, it hits an outside uh, point in the channel, there's some deflection, it crosses over, and then we see a, 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 a sinuous S-shaped curve around this other side of the bend. Okay, this is what the streams want to do, is they want to meander back and forth in their floodplain. So as we look at the stream elevation, you know, we're less than an inch deep here. By the time we go on the outside bend here, we're up uh, 
uh, four or almost five inches deep. This is the deepest part of the channel. As this water is trying to meander, the deep part of the channel, called the thalwag, moves back and forth. Okay, it gets uh, deeper on the cut bank side of the channel, it crosses over and it cuts the other side of the bank out. Uh, in between, we oftentimes have these riffles, which are these fast moving parts of the stream. Okay, so we have a pool, we have a riffle, and another pool. This is what streams want to do. This is the natural behavior of them. It's just unfortunate here in Walnut Creek is that we're, we're seeing this uh, in an incised channel that's you know 12 feet below its floodplain. But this is a natural feature of how streams want to move and migrate. Our, the geology of this watershed is largely dominated by silt, which is a, a, a specific size particle typical of windblown lus. Okay, so we have this lus cap everywhere. That silt is largely the, the source of the sediment in the stream. So our bottom of the stream bed is largely composed of silt. Where we see some high energy pass over um, this substrate, then we kind of wash the silt and clay away and we might be left with sand and gravel behind. And so in various riffle areas where we see some corn port of uh, uh, flow, uh, concentrated flow, we see a lot of the silt washed away and we get more natural substrate of sands and gravels. Now if you took a snapshot of one of these stream banks across here, what you're going to see is that we have a bottom of the stream bed, then we have a layer that used to be the top of the floodplain, okay, uh, which is typically is a dark uh, banded uh, uh, unit that you can recognize very easily if we had an exposed bank. The upper four to six feet here is all consisting of post-settlement alluvium. This is all the sediment that eroded from the landscape that filled the floodplain up, essentially. So we have a record of sediment deposition in this watershed over the last hundred and some years uh, that record the deposition of early sediment uh, erosion from the uplands in this floodplain. So the incision that we see here is both a combination of downcutting uh, because of the high energy water, in addition to filling some of the bank height just because we have a lot of post-settlement deposition. Okay, so it's really we've, we're accumulating this this level of incision down to 10 or 12 feet with half of it being the down cutting and half of it being essentially the the deposition on top of it. So another consequence of this channel incision in the lower stream level than it was historically is what effect that's had on the riparian zone. In a normal stream situation, uh, if you walk from an upland to the stream, things oftentimes get wetter because the stream is in closer contact to the, to the ground surface. And these channel incision uh, occurrences, what you've done is lowered the base level of the water. And what that has done is had a ripple effect out in the riparian zone. So now, if we walked up these banks is in probably um, 30 or 40, 50 feet in, the banks are actually very dry. So um, instead of getting wetter as you go to the stream channel, we've dewatered this entire riparian zone and caused the banks to be dry, which is an interesting occurrence, but it really has an effect as a, as a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service try and restore uh, a natural assemblage of vegetation along the stream banks. Well, you can't, certainly, you can't install um, uh, wet meadow sedges next to the channel because it's just too dry. In fact, you could put an upland oak tree next to the channel, it would do very well because the banks are dry. So there's an implication here about how to even restore a situation like this when we've dewatered things so much that our hydrology is, is really out of whack. With this channel incision that what we see, um, you might think, you know, that's really unfortunate for Walnut Creek watershed that the channel looks like this and it bears this consequence of all the upland activities. Unfortunately, um, this, isn't, uh, this isn't uncommon. This is really pretty much the state of most of our streams in Iowa, is that so many of them are incised into their floodplains. We have uh, consequences of accelerated stream bed and bank erosion. Bank erosion in this watershed can account for half the sediment export in this basin is coming from stream bank erosion. Um, so, this is not, it's not uh, natural, certainly not natural in terms of how this should have been 
uh, behaving pre-settlement, but this is not uncommon. This is exactly what we see everywhere. In fact, more uncommon would be to see a natural stream uh, that is in, in touch with its floodplain, that shows the natural features of cut banks and point bars, uh, and is allowed to uh, uh, flood naturally into its floodplain. So here, uh, we've mapped the stream bank conditions up and down this watershed, and as much as 40% of the stream banks are eroding in this channel. Uh, in a natural floodplain environment, that might be about 20%. So we have at minimum twice as much eroding stream banks, and those are generating a lot of uh, excessive sediment export from this basin. Uh, sediment export, sediment is the main carrier for a nutrient of phosphorus. So when we talk about sediment export, we're also talking about phosphorus export downstream, that much of our phosphorus export here is coming from the stream banks and the stream bed as opposed to all the upland contributions. So if we're gonna solve our nutrient problem for phosphorus or reduce sediment, we really need to think about addressing the hydrology uh, in addition to any sort of application or any sort of land surface activities. Until we get the hydrology right, this, will, this was just gonna naturally evolve over time and take a long time. Mm -hmm.